Hi, um, I'm Elias. I work at Meta. I'm going to be talking about uh, CUDA graphs today. So first, uh, a background on CUDA graphs, then our initial torch.compile integration, our new integration, CUDA graph trees, and finally, use cases and results. Um, so a CUDA graph is a static record of GPU work. Kernels, kernel arguments, kernel execution dependencies are fixed and you replay a captured CUDA graph to run all of the kernels with those same arguments and dependencies, which also typically means on the same memory addresses. Only CUDA memory changes during graph replay. So on the left, we have a PyTorch eager workload. On the right is that same workload with CUDA graphs. Um, the blue columns are when the GPU is active. Uh, gaps occur from CPU overhead where we're not feeding the GPU fast enough. Each kernel invocation PyTorch has overhead. Um, there's overhead from creating a tensor object and calculating its metadata, error checking, getting a memory allocation from the CUDA caching allocator, overhead from the Python interpreter itself, the dispatch system. And on the right, with CUDA graph, we keep the GPU busy and greatly speed up the workload. So some CUDA graph limitations, um, and, the, and here I'm talking about CUDA graph itself as the NVIDIA API and not necessarily our integration. Um, so no dynamic shapes, kernel invocation arguments are fixed, which includes tensor sizes, no dynamic control flow. We only capture a, a single series of kernel invocations, all of which will be replayed, and no GPU and CPU synchronization uh, so when we do initial CUDA graph tracing, we are just capturing the uh, kernels we invoke and not actually running them. So the CUDA memory is not written to, and you know transferring memory to CPU would both like not actually reflect what it would should be equal to when you run the program, and would not generalize to other traces. And um, also no CPU side effects. You know the whole point here is to cut CPU overhead out of the trace and just record what's happening in CUDA. Um, and there's some other less common um, constraints you can look up. So the previous torch.compile CUDA graph integration had speed ups, but often at a memory cost. Um, PyTorch reserves uh, CUDA memory in a caching allocator layer to avoid costly CUDA alloc and CUDA free APIs. This is a memory pool. Each new inductor graph or recompilation had its own memory pool which could not be shared with the others. Uh, their memory would stack. So we have on the right the user uh, who heroically worked around some of these issues because the performance gain warranted the extra work, but user workarounds like this shouldn't be necessary. Um, so as we can see in this diagram, each separate graph has its own private memory pool, which increases total memory use. Um, even without graph breaks in user code, there is an implicit graph break between forward and backward. So if you're training, even without graph breaks, you would still see this problem. Um, this is particularly problematic because activations allocated in the forward are often large, and you would like to be able to reclaim that memory in the backward. Um, taking a look at this example, first we need to copy over the contents of x to x prime. So as I mentioned, CUDA graph fixes memory addresses. So because the code is coming from eager allocator, we have no guarantee that X will be in the same place the next time we invoke the CUDA graph. So we copy X into our own pool where we can uh, control that the, its new memory address will be available when we invoke CUDA graph next. And we also do the same thing between graphs one and two and, and two and three. And no, in addition to memory penalty, there's a perf penalty from the, the coffee kernels. Um, so this is our new integration, which is CUDA graph trees. Um, there's a single CUDA memory pool across all captures. This will recreate the same series of allocations and deallocations that Eager had as we were reusing the same caching allocator logic. We no longer need to copy from graph one to graph two or any two inductor CUDA graph compilations. And we achieve this by completely specializing on anything that affects memory patterns. So the prior graph path, tensor liveness during and between graph patterns, whether or not a tensor address is coming from eager or CUDA memory pool, 
Um, and we also support control flow. And we support control flow by specializing on the complete, complete path taken through the program. So on the left, we have a function call graph, which will invoke function one, then two or three, and then function four. Um, so first in our example, we invoke function one, two, and four. Um, note, each path requires a warm-up run, uh, graph recording, and then we'll use the hot path from there on out. Um, so after we do one, two, and four, um, then we invoke a new path in one, three, then four. Um, so instead of you reusing the existing CUDA graph recording, which we had for function four, we will create a new recording for four. We can't reuse the existing graph recording because it will have baked in memory addresses from two, which might differ than those coming from three. Um, so thus creating a tree of CUDA graphs. Um, note, we are able to record graph three even after hitting the hot path in graph one. This would not have been previously possible in PyTorch because when we hit the hot path, we are not updating the CUDA caching allocator state in a way that would reflect tensor liveness in order to avoid overhead. Without tensor liveness, it wouldn't be safe to make a new allocation to the caching allocator. So we checkpoint the state of the CUDA caching allocator after each recording so that we can reapply and resume from it later if we need to do a new recording. And we also apply any tensor liveness deltas that might have occurred between one graph and the other. Um, so some limitations. Memory isn't shared with the eager memory pool. If you're not using CUDA graphs for your entire model, you'll experience memory overhead. Um, we don't have a great way of having a dependency from one iteration of training or inference to the next, although there are some workarounds. If you did have a dependency, it would introduce uh, jitter to memory addresses, which doesn't work with CUDA graphs. Um, and there are also some cases where we will not lower to CUDA graphs, check warnings, and you know if it's particularly um, difficult, please file an issue and it's something we can work on. Um, so one use case is model serving in Python. Um, CUDA graphs completely remove CPU overhead, so it's a great way to serve optimized deployment in Python without Python overheads. Um, warm up your model first, then serve. Um, and note, you know, there are reasons to avoid um, Python deployments, just, you know, compilation time, things like that, um, which, um, and, and for those use cases, AOT inductor is great, which uh, Ben will be talking about later. Um, use case, dynamic shapes. So Ed touched on this earlier, but even if you have dynamic shapes in your model or are serving dynamic shapes, you can still use CUDA graphs without memory overhead. Um, and we do a single inductor compilation and then re-record a CUDA graph for every unique shape it's invoked with. Um, recordings are, are much faster than compilations, so this is feasible and, and, and works well in many scenarios. Um, and, and note, uh, each kernel launch takes uh, 65 kilobytes of CUDA memory. This is just a, a CUDA issue. You know, they're talking about a driver fix, so maybe in a couple of years you'll not have this limitation, but with really big models and a lot of compilations, sometimes this can add up. Um, so the, all these results are taken from our dashboard using GeoMean. Um, Hugging Face is a series of mostly transformers. Tim, vision models, TorchBench is a, a number of different models. Um, and as you can see, for all the benchmarks, memory gets a big bunk from our previous integration. Um, and also note, as you increase batch size, CUDA graph perf win will decrease. Um, some of the batch sizes here are lower than you might typically use because of our benchmarking setup. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt and, and try on your own model. Um, and here are a series of models folks are excited about, um, particularly the more, you know, overhead bound models uh, get a larger perf bump. Um, on batch size one, we expect the biggest improvement from CUDA graph because overhead is a fixed cost that does not scale up with increasing batch size or other dimensions. Um, so this kind of best case perf win scenario from CUDA graphs. Um, so just to conclude, for best perf, use CUDA graphs, even in dynamic workloads. It's enabled with mode equals reduced overhead or mode equals um, max auto tune. And um, yeah, that's it for uh, my slides, thanks.
Oops. So uh, yeah, we have time for some questions now. If anyone has any. Um, it, it might be possible, but, it, um, you know, that'd be very, like, it it'd depend on the actual inductor compilation, and it'd be, I think, it may be possible in, in some cases, but add a, a lot of complication, and, um, we, we would no longer be able to use a lot of the, like, eager, um, allocation, uh, eager allocation logic and uh, another thing is like some you know inductor will compile most of your your code and uh but it won't for all of them if you have like custom kernels or things like that and then within those custom kernels um we don't have visibility into what the allocation logic would look like so it would like it, it wouldn't generalize but maybe in particular some scenarios uh you could Um, this was so the benchmarks here. So Kudagraphs is only a, a, a GPU speed, uh, optimization, and in the benchmarks there, it was on a A100. Um, I think AMD has hip graphs, which uh, I think should work as well. Although I haven't um, tested that uh, myself, but feasibly it should work with hip graphs as well. <laughs> 